Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another installment of Fluid Thoughts, the conversation that organizes us to explore what the possibilities are around sustainability and the low carbon agenda, and engaging both the solutions and a deeper understanding of the problems that we currently face in the world. And our guest today is someone that is quite phenomenal. Her name is Samantha Supia. She is a young person and really represents some of the youth leadership in this domain in the world. She self-describes as a design strategist for sustainability and regeneration. And she's going to unpack that for us during the course of the interview. She has spent time all over the world, much of that time in the developed world, in, in London and Edinburgh at Stockholm. She has now returned to the space that she really wants to use as the epicenter of new change in the world and is based in Manila Metro in the Philippines. Samantha, good morning and welcome. Hi, Des. Thank you for having me and for saying all these nice things. Well, let, let us kick off. So there has been a change in the global conversation and even the most ardent skeptics have to absorb this and accept it. We have seen the start of 2021 after a hugely difficult 2020 with some very important pronouncements in the world. I mean, there was the Climate Action Summit at the beginning of the year, which set out a vector to where we might be going. The World Economic Forum, uh, organized itself under the theme of the Great Reset, acknowledging as a global economy that maybe it's been the wrong trajectory for a long, long time. As we sit now, the spring meetings of the Bretton Woods institutions, in particular the World Bank and the IMF, have organized themselves under the banner moving forward towards a green agenda. Unusual sounds from unusual spaces unexpectedly. What should we be making of this? Well, in my opinion, it's, it's very much more of the same. This is, these announcements are, in my opinion, humanity's best innovation in propaganda. Straight, I think, from the colonial era. These are people in power who want to remain in power while sort of slowly trying to recognize that they've got us to a really terrible place. Um, and you can easily see that by asking the question, who's not in the room? Sustainable business consultant Kenneth Pucker of Berkshire Partners, he recently wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review called Overselling Sustainability Reporting. And in it, he uses a phrase that refers to these folk who are adamant on the greenwashing. He uses the phrase Sustainability Inc. This is the new business as usual crowd. Let's slather on another layer of lipstick onto the pig as it continues the same mode of egotistical destruction and extractivist te technocracy, really. This approach to civilization, this approach to global resource management is finally, I think, arriving to its ugly end. It won't be in our lifetimes that it actually ends, but. What I see in these announcements is the dinosaurs that are thrashing loudly now in a sort of semi-denial as they're slowly sinking into this thick tar that is the fossil fuel demise. Unfortunately, these dinosaurs are taking all of the world's ecosystems down with them. That's pretty much what we're experiencing here in Southeast Asia. So this is, in my opinion, our lack of imagination of what radical change really is, of how humanity really needs to operate on our planet and for what purpose, for whose benefit and why this greenwashing is still acceptable in this, in this day and age, in the time of COVID and how happy we are as you know, the rest of humanity to hand over the state of the future to these people who seek to continue to hoard and control the planet's resources in the same way that they've been doing for 200 years. Because they have experts, because they have science, because they have influence and power. So that's really what I see when I look at a lot of these happenings at you know, high level conversations 
where people in suits go to places that look nothing like what a human being should actually be in and make statements that no human being should ever say. Okay, uh, let, me, let me challenge you on that a little bit um, and, and add this to the conversation. Uh, what, what people are, are talking about, I mean, look, the timing might be associated with the jolt that everyone got out of COVID-19. Uh, it was unexpected in the first place, but the even more unexpected thing is those places in the world that in fact had a very high epidemiology preparedness index really didn't think that it would affect them as much as it did. So there is that factor. But there is also that factor that for the last little while, at least for the past five years, places like uh, the World Economic Forum have been putting out in their global risk register as an expression of the perception of their membership that this quartet of environmental factors, climate change, extreme weather, uh, water crisis, biodiversity loss, was in fact in that realm of the highest impact with the highest likelihood. So is this not in part a natural expression of the need to do something about it after saying this was a problem for all that time? Isn't there that factor involved as well? I think we had that chance in 1972 when the Club of Rome released its initial limits to growth. I think also the, the kind of narrative that nobody could have predicted a global pandemic is false. We have been largely talking about this in futures worlds and I guess geopolitical strategy for a long time. We even have video games about it because we know that this is a plausible event. And to say that COVID was unpredictable is almost a farce. It's an excuse that I think the people in power want to perpetuate to avoid them having to take responsibility for poor leadership. Good point, good point. So, so let, let's, let's move, move that a bit further. So what should the pronouncements be? Who should be saying them? And what are the actions that need to follow? I think it starts with that question of who is not in the room who are making decisions and who are not making decisions, whose voices are heard and whose voices are not being heard. We've done this entire thing all wrong from the very start, simply because we believe in people who are experts and we don't listen to the people who are in their own right experts of how to actually live sustainably, for example, with the land. And in fact, not just sustainably, but to actively be regenerating the land upon which they live. And these people are oftentimes the smallholder farmers who are currently protesting because we're in the midst of a highly corporatized UN food system summit that will be emerging uh, towards the later half of this year. In terms of what I think we should be hearing and seeing, when we talk about the voices that are not currently being heard, we need to be seeing and hearing more of how colonialism continues to impact our lives in every sort of way. And when I'm talking about colonialism, I don't just mean political colonialism in terms of one country taking over the territory of another country or imposing their laws upon them, for example. I'm also talking about the way corporate does it around the entire world. The exact same patterns of colonialism that the European colonialists very deliberately designed and exerted through military power are very much at play today on a subversive level, but you can see it if you, if you start to spot the patterns. They're actually pretty obvious. And obviously bear in mind, this is all possible in the first place because of this religion that we have of race supremacy, which we're trying to make excuses for at the moment by saying that it doesn't really exist or we're having debates around, is this actually a thing? Or, you know, is Brazil a racist country, for example? This is impossible to me to be having this conversation right now. So I don't think we quite understand just how much damage colonialism dealt to our global diverse cultures as well. And I think this still happens today. And it's not just in terms of economic colonization, I think it's cultural colonization as well. Like how loud, for example, the US is, everybody's consuming US media, for example, over their own media. And that's, that entire machine is very carefully curated to be able to sort of extract culture from other parts of the world, misappropriate it, and then sell it back to you as something that is flashy or desirable. 
on top of that, there's this entire sector of international development, which really needs to work on its eco-fascist approach to aid, in my opinion. We are not focusing on systemic levers because we are afraid somehow of approaching those with power and telling them what they don't want to hear. This is how we end up in business as usual, I think. So for me, what we should be listening to is, is exactly what we should be doing now. If we want a sustainable existence on some sort of regenerated planet, it's not going to look like you know, the same because we will have complete and total climate change. But what we must do now is to start working on decolonizing ourselves. And we can start by decolonizing our minds. And we can do that by reading decolonial theory. We can seek decolonial communities where we are, people who are essentially trying to do the same. There's a movie that I really recommend, especially for those in Europe, called The Uprising, which is a film directed by an artist called Pravini. She's a very prolific Netherlands-based artist within the decolonizing the mind movement. And in my opinion, until we're really starting to talk about these things seriously at that sort of level, we're not really seeing the right picture. That's really interesting. Um, uh, let me remind you of something from my own generation. Um, and I grew up when, when I was your age in a very difficult South Africa. It's a better South Africa now. It's far from where it needs to be, but we were in the midst of apartheid. And one of the anthems that we used to sing along to, to keep us going was in fact, using philosophers like Bob Marley. And he was quite pronounced when he said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, because none but ourselves can free our minds. So I expressed this to you the first time we met yes. at the Club of Rome conference. And I expressed an exasperation because I could not understand how the youth of the 21st century is not as militantly revolutionary as what I was familiar with when I was growing up. How do you explain that? There are so many ways that I can explain that. I can explain that from our different levels of lostness. And I can explain that from the lack of power that we have over, over our own lives. In your time, there were things that nobody tried to take away from you as much as we are experiencing now today. Literally, the only thing we have is, you know, like the meme joke, avocado toast. That's all we have, Starbucks and avocado toast. We don't have access to housing. We don't have access to jobs. We don't have access to medical services. We don't really have a place to be. We have been it kind of suppressed and we accept this as normal because it's happening to our entire generation everywhere. So what, what is there to do except to, to be depressed? That is my sort of understanding of the millennial generation in particular. But then when you look at the youth of today, the teenagers, who are just coming through so educated about all of these things that they cannot find at school because they grew up with social media and social activism as a normality. So I think it, it's about conforming to the kind of normal that your generation is sort of fit into because of the lines that we draw within our cultures around, you know, what is a millennial generation and what is the Gen Z, etc. So I think ultimately speaking, this, this sort of, apathy or deadness within especially my generation, you know, 40 and below who are millennials. This is just a lost generation. This is what we see as well, right? Just before the breakout of the First World War, where there's just, you know, there's nothing that we have nothing to grasp onto. And we have no, our minds are so stolen that we have no agency to actually do anything about it except feel the frustrations there. So this is this is a sort of um, if you see it as a curve, then it's sort of the you know the top of the curve where there is no gradient. That's really interesting. I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit further on that because um, I carry some beliefs from my own generation that honestly does not understand the powerlessness that is currently felt. I hear what you're saying. But I'm going to pick that up uh, a little bit just now. But I want to ask you one more other question. You made a very conscious choice. You were in capitals that are very influencing in the world. You chose to leave those capitals to go to, to Southeast Asia because you thought that this could really be the epicenter of the regeneration that you want to see. P please explain that. 
I think it's very simple. Change happens when people are desperate enough for change. Desperation happens when collective experience is being felt as collective. Here in the Philippines, which is the most climate battered nation on the planet, I think aside from Japan, except that Japan has money to deal with it, that's exactly what's happening. People are experiencing this, this battered nature of, ex of existence without any help whatsoever from the government, NGO organizations who claim to be delivering international aid into the Philippines, and most often even without the help of big businesses here who have always traditionally, even in colonial times, supported the communities that they, that they live around. So this sense of abandonment, I think, that's being felt on a collective level starts to bleed into the culture here. And you start to see where those future points of learning start to come about. So in futures now, we talk about um, place-based learning ecosystems as though this has never existed before in the history of humanity, right? But this is what I'm looking for here in the Philippines. And I find them everywhere. You never hear about them on Facebook, on social media, anywhere online. There is nothing you can search. You simply have to be at the places which are experiencing these things and experience it with them in order to understand what it really means, what it really feels like. So that's the reason why I'm here in Metro Manila. And I came here without knowing why, actually. I came here with this random expectation that I would understand why the Philippines is, you know, what I see from the outside as the most advanced with regards to what we now call sustainable development in Southeast Asia. And I, there was another reason, which is despite the 500 odd years of colonization by four or five different global powers, the Philippines and the many different diverse cultures within the Philippines retain a sense of empathy, a really clear internationally well-known identifiable sense of empathy between people, person to person. Nowhere else in Southeast Asia do I know such a thing that is as strong as this. So that, those reasons come together are essentially why I decided to be here in a pandemic and to learn from these amazing people who do so much with so little and are still able to laugh about it <laughs> on YouTube. Well, that is quite amazing, actually. I mean, that's a really refreshing perspective because the conventional wisdom about where the Philippines is uh, in global politics and global geopolitics today is a, is a very unpleasant place, to say the least. I mean, there are more difficult words that one can use. Um, but I do see what you're saying, uh, that you need a particular seedbed for revolutionary change, yes. which is being actively subdued in too many places in the world. But that gives me the launch pad to return to your previous point around decolonization, around worldwide inequality, so much so that Antonio Guterres, when he, he did the Mandela lecture last year, talked about inequality as the global pandemic that we really have to deal with. And he was very descriptive about that. The term that we like to use down here in the southern part of Africa is talking about global apartheid. Yeah. There are two challenges around this. One is the world has spent a lot of effort to, I was going to say whitewash, but that would be precisely the wrong word here, to, if you like, to color wash that there isn't such a problem yes. uh, and we have to deal with that. But within that, you have this further segmentation around vulnerable groups. So it's not only race, it is also sex. And we live in a, an extremely ageist society. One maybe that we didn't expect, but as people live for much longer, this is becoming reinforced in much more powerful ways. Now, in the way you're thinking about this, in the way you're seeing it, in your arena of operation, how do you understand it? And what are the things that really need to be done in order to change this around? I think it's interesting you bring up the use of this phrase, crisis or pandemic of inequality. I actually see that as simply a symptom of our spiritual crisis, our moral crisis as a human race, because we've we've lost so much connection to what, what kind of animals we should really be on the planet. And this crisis of morality is, is most evident in, in the inequalities that we are, we're seeing all around the world. 
right? No country is, you know, Norway, for example, has inequalities. Norway has poverty, right? And in my opinion, I don't think we're actually doing any work right now to try to resolve global inequality. If that's something that we were trying to do, then we were digging in the wrong place. I think we don't seem to be doing much of this real work because we're avoiding the issue of sovereignty. We seem to not want to listen to human rights activists, food sovereignty activists, etc., who are talking about giving power of self-determination back to the people who should be determining the, the way that they live their lives. So I think this for me is why I talk about decolonization because this is the outcome of real decolonization, like on a systemic level. I think we will know it has worked when we have entire communities regaining their cultural identities and therefore relearning how to coexist again within their bioregions amongst their neighbors. And none of that is going to be perfect, right? But it's, it's, not, it's not no one who is asking for this stuff. The activists are. They have never been heard. And it starts with, like in my opinion, it starts with seed sovereignty, the ability to grow your own food using the seeds that you have. Hundreds of millions of people around the world active in the global peasant movement today are fighting for this. 250 million people in India have been protesting for three years. And it seems the West didn't know about it until Rihanna tweeted about it. And then the far right ruling party in India, the BJP, demanded the US to deport Rihanna to India, the audacity. I could not make this up, right? So all of these political distractions are, I think, intentional. They're very intentional to try to misdirect attention away from the real work that actually needs to be done, which in my opinion is repatriations and reparations. We need to return what was stolen. There's something that economic anthropologist Jason Hickel says. He says a lot of things, of course. He himself was, of course, born and raised in Eswatini and is today a leading voice in global inequality, arguing for decolonization. His research, for example, finds that the global north is responsible for 92% of historical CO2 emissions, so cumulative CO2 emissions in excess of the planetary boundary. And he talks about the wealth that was stolen throughout the last 600 years of the colonial project, which of course is currently ongoing. So until we move away from this false story that climate change or inequalities was caused by all of humanity, that it's sort of embedded within all of us, when it was actually of course caused by the colonialists and capitalists, and until we can recognize that at the highest levels, we're just doing business as usual greenwashing. And by the same vein, until we can recognize at the highest levels or acknowledge that we are, our global trade policies continue to extract and oppress the global south in order to benefit the global north, until we recognize that and we really try to work that out on a systems level, we're not doing anything to resolve global inequalities. I hear you. And, and, and that analysis is, is largely accurate, I think. Uh, maybe with one important addition, that what the North, and the North is very fuzzy nowadays, has been very successful in doing, is to have agents of this paradigm of differential benefit all over the world. In fact, that may well be the most successful globalization project to date. So how does one tackle this? Because clearly, we're still in the space where this power base, this global paradigm is run by a very small group of people. It's less than 1% of the world's population. Can it actually be that the other 99% of us are that disempowered that we can't navigate a way through this in a reasonable enough way? I think for this, I have to reference Tupac. He said three very simple words. The poor have to eat the rich. And when he said that, he meant it literally. That's how visceral he saw the revolution that was coming was. And he was so far ahead of his time when he said this, right? Because he and his neighborhoods were experiencing the things that we're all talking about. So these revolutionary sort of sparks that I think need to happen, they're not actually going to be the ones that help us shift. Because the more you have this sort of force of anger, force of frustration, force of, you know, 
we need to draw a line between them and us. You're either with us or you're with them. You know, that sort of, I think, agenda that very often activists have because they need to place their anger and frustration somewhere. I don't think that's going to get us very far. That's essentially more of the same. So while I'm not advocating for Kumbaya, we all love each other, I do think that there's a, there's a sense of firmness and, and um, sort of abstractness that we have to deal with things with. Because oftentimes people are taking it at a very personal level and they're very vindictive about it, you know? So moving away from this personal, like, attack sort of situation requires maturity. So I'm sorry, but we go back to leadership in terms of personal growth. And personal growth needs to be achieved on a collective level, not an individual level. Part of the reason why we feel so much that we have to be angry about something is because that fits our branding, because we are an individual that needs to have an identity that is very centered and clear. And we need to have a brand that we put out to the world. This is the form of individualism that the West has essentially marketed to the rest of the world as buy our products, because this is how you can show that you're an individual, right? But that has moved us away from the collectivism that we see actually very naturally emerging in the global south every single day. That's how it shows up. So we haven't entirely lost our cultures there. And what I would speak to is pride. This, this way of talking about, you know, most youth in the Philippines, they say the most important thing that you can ever do in the Philippines is to leave. That's so disappointing for me as somebody who's come here to learn because I see the richness of what young people who are starting businesses today out of nothing are, are approaching with this with this amazing grand energy and they they see themselves as this don you know downtrodden peoples because this is the narrative that the entire world is putting onto them as you rightly point out with geopolitics but again the state is different from the people the state is different from the cultures. The state is different from the communities. And what young people are doing here, I think, particularly in this current era of, I don't know, it's 50% unemployed adult population currently, and then the government just stopped counting. They were like, we don't need to know beyond that. At least we know that 50% of you guys have jobs. That's good. Um, and so this is the climate within which we're working with, I guess. Mm. This, this is rich. This is really fascinating. And, and, and actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to be keen to, to organize another and, and explore this a little bit further. But, but as we round up, uh, this is my last question to you. We want to build this global conscience. We know we have to do things very differently. We know it requires a very different kind of investment. But more than that, we are inviting the world into this pathway where the first step is to sacrifice the comforts that you currently have. This is a big deal. We also know, and I think it's very difficult to deny, that we have actively disempowered many groups in the world. Women, youth, people with disability, there's a race base to this. So my question to you is, as we hold hands as part of this new global conscience, what do folk in my generation, who generally sit in the seats of power, need to do to help to agentize a little bit further, empower a little bit further, the younger people of the world who are the ones that are going to lead us into this revolutionary change? This is, this is the real question. So what you're asking here is what work needs to be done inside and outside. Um, and I think it always starts with inside. So the personal growth aspect, dealing with your own, whatever you consider to be your trauma, your pain, your identities, being ready to shed that, being ready to listen to other points of view. I think this is the biggest hurdle that any of these people you have pointed out will need to face. And if they are surrounded by people who are not willing to do that, then they are not curating the right environment for themselves to actually help the world move into some element or some form of a sustainable planet. So I think this inner work that we talk about, inner regeneration, as we refer to in the circles of regeneration, needs to happen as a first point of call. If that work is not being done, everything else 
is simply a part of the crisis. This is something that Bayo Akomalafe asks us regularly. He says, what if the crisis is how we respond to the crisis? So this inner work is the most crucial thing. And it's very difficult to do because it's very difficult to find people who are talking about what that work actually is. And the truth is it will be different depending on your context and the, the levers that you have to pull, right? On a daily basis, particularly. However, I think part of this, but you know, how do we curate the environment within which people can be invited or feel ready to actually do that work, right? So this is the setting the foundations or creating the conditions to be able to ripen this sort of um, initiative. So I think how to do that uh, in, in kind of the little experience that I have is to network weave. And this is a, a new form of understanding how to build solidarity in very careful ways because we must not expose overexposed or underexposed peoples to the great ignorance that we all have, particularly in corporate business. And so what I think the network weaving um, can do is to bring together particularly intergenerational relationships like you talked about. So it's not necessarily about giving youth the leadership, but rather to support the youth in a way where these intergenerational relationships are actually centering upon the future human generations. And the focus of this work should be what kind of future human generation do we want to leave Mother Earth? That is really the question we should be asking ourselves. And this, I think, helps us to start to imagine new modes of almost indigeneity, where it's a system of living that we are in true reciprocity with nature's entities and ecosystems. So I think until we are asking these really real questions, heavy questions, any parent should be asking these questions. Um, we can't really start to do that in a work until we're asking these questions collectively together. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I want to say two things. First is that although you have been piercing in describing the problematic, I have to say that folk like me take real heart from the kind of leadership that you already display. And the second thing I want to say, and since you brought it into the conversation, there's a quote from Rihanna that I think very aptly describes how I think about you. And she says, there is something so special about a woman who dominates in a man's world. It takes a certain grace, strength, intelligence, fearlessness, and the nerve to never take no for an answer. Samantha Supia, thank you for being such an inspiration. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.